Let's look at the first of these. Uh, uh, licensing options for overseas campuses and for uh, related uh, um, uh, um, activities like uh, uh, MOOCs. Why are British universities um, keen on MOOCs? Why am I here talking about MOOCs today? Well, uh, David Willits, whose picture you see, uh, see here on the screen, who's the Minister for Universities and Science, actually visiting my university in central London uh, yesterday. Uh, along actually with the Japanese Prime Minister as well, so big day for us in uh, UCLS today. Uh, David Willits thinks that massive open online courses are the future of education. Uh, and of course, if you take that to its logical extension, it questions the reason for a university, uh, as it currently uh, is uh, formulated, to exist at all. Because if education is a, 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 an experience which can be um, uh, made available down the wire over the network uh, to you where you live. What, why do you need a, a university like the University of Cambridge, which was uh, founded in the 13th century, which is where I studied? <laughs> or why, why do you need a university like UCL, which is the third university in England, which was founded in 1826, and the first university in England to admit women on the same basis as men? So is MOOC, MOOCs, uh, for good or for, for ill, is a, a massive um, 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 example of, of changes in, in possible licensing arrangements. I'm going to come on and talk about the challenges of those. But let me talk first about uh, overseas campuses. I, I've talked about uh, the kinds of uh, uh, overseas campus that a, a UK university would have. I talked about my institution in the UK. How do we deal with these? Well, uh, the students, if they're in, in Qatar, or if they're in Adelaide, in UCL Australia, would need to register centrally with central UCL systems in, in London in order to be covered by any extensions to our licenses. So the principle that the publishers take, which is not an easy one for universities to deliver on, is that you need central registration. Uh, we then have, through JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee, uh, a, a model license that we uh, uh, use uh, to um, uh, undertake licensing of commercial content. But this license at the publisher's request actually excludes students that are uh, at, uh, uh, registered at partner organisations. So it doesn't include overseas campuses. So this uh, brings uh, a whole he heap of problems because then the students in UCM Adelaide or in Kazakhstan or in Qatar or in the other parts of the globe where we are going to open overseas campuses and partnerships, they have to be covered by an extension to the uh, license that we take out in London, in, uh, in, in UCL, in Bloomsbury. And they're not automatically covered by the license. And just uh, have uh, developed a, a decision tool which, help, which helps universities to understand uh, the criteria that are in play in order uh, for them to take out an uh, extension license. So a university would go through the decision-making tool here, given the URL, and that would help them decide um, the, the cases when they need an extension to the, the model license. And most publishers, as a result of this activity of, of having extensions to current licenses, will allow uh, the overseas campuses to be registered, but for extra money, for a small uplift in the licensing fee. So that's the solution on, on the left-hand side. The, the challenges of this on, on the right-hand side, most, uh, but not all publishers, use the GIST model license. Um, many publisher licenses, if they're using their own license, will exclude, explicitly exclude overseas uh, uh, campuses. Uh, and some publishers want to handle additional users on an institution and by institution basis, rather than by taking a global or international approach. And that's incredibly difficult for universities, because if you're competing with uh, other organizations, other universities to, for, uh, for students in your overseas campuses, in Qatar, there are many educational establishments, for example, in, in Education City. There isn't just UCL. There are a, whole, a, ho a ho um, heap of universities not making an educational offering there. There is then, you've introduced an element of competition, because uh, the level of pricing, which the publisher sets, will dictate the amount of fee that you charge the student. So there is a, it's directly relevant to universities. So uh, I've talked about licensing issues and, and the rather messy uh, um, uh, scenario for um, overseas campuses, even messier for these new modes of delivery for MOOCs or spooks, because actually there's no agreement between universities, 
content uh, producers and publishers on how to provide licenses. And so what you tend to find is that most MOOC uh, providers or those universities offering MOOCs will uh, run to open access content because that's free. It's covered by a Creative Commons license. It's therefore free of most licensing restrictions or at least the license in which that, uh, under which that material is available is known and understood and encourages the kind of mode of study, the open, massive, open online course that MOOCs is supposed to uh, um, support. We need to be clear as an international community who is responsible for discuss discussing or taking a lead in identifying what the issues around licensing in a MOOC uh, context is like. In my own country, in uh, the United Kingdom, the University of Edinburgh, not my university, but the University of Edinburgh in Scotland runs MOOCs. They have up to 100,000 students registered on a MOOCs course. That's four times the number of students they have registered living physically in Edinburgh for a British university, the typical size of a large research intensive university like mine or Edinburgh is around 25 or 30,000 students. But Edinburgh is, in, is registering 100,000 students for, um, uh, on its MOOCs course. Huge uh, uh, a number of issues then about how these students get the same sort of experience, educational experience, remotely as they would if they were resident in Edinburgh on a traditional three-year course. There is no agreement in the UK, and I think no agreement uh, internationally, on who is responsible for identifying what good practice is in licensing material for MOOCs, and who should undertake, on a global level, those discussions with publishers. And if MOOCs is uh, the future of higher education, I'm not personally convinced that it is, but if it is the future of higher education, as our Minister for Universities insists that it is, then those issues need to be sorted out because you not then have because if you don't sort them out you're not offering a parity of educational experience to students because it will differ in the same institution whether they're based um, domestically in Edinburgh or UCL or in one of the overseas campuses. Second point, and then I will finish. I don't won't need five minutes, thanks, Stuart, but thanks for reminding me. Uh, I want to talk about uh, text and data mining. What is text and data mining? Uh, it derives uh, information from uh, machine-read uh, material, and it works by copying large quantities of material, extracting data, and then recombining it to identify patterns. And the LIBA information sheet on text and data mining, which my colleague Susan Riley is here in the room, uh, I think right at the back, wrote is available on the, um, uh, on the, it's available on your desktop. And uh, if you believe in open scholarship, open science, new modes of delivery and learning, then it's an essential aspect of research and education in, in, the, in the modern world. Because it's how you want to make new combinations of ideas, how you want to draw meaning from enormous corpuses of material that w it would be physically impossible to analyse manually by, by reading them all. Now we think that less TDM activity is undertaken in Europe than in other parts of the globe because of our European copyright frameworks and we've done some measuring to prove to our satisfaction that Europe is at a disadvantage because we haven't tackled the TDM issue correctly. Some publishers offer licenses for TDM, which many of our researchers in uh, uh, the UK, uh, on, on the continent of Europe, find restrictive. Uh, and position, certainly, of UK academic uh, university libraries like mine, is that we will not sign publisher TDM licenses, because we believe we've already bought the right to mine that content through the license where we purchased access. So as the Libra leaflet says, the right to read equals the right to mine. So we're not interested in licensing solutions. And the EU TDM expert group, uh, which has uh, just issued its report on text and data mining, has come up with exactly the same uh, position, that we should introduce into uh, European copyright frameworks an exception for uh, text and data mining, or, or a broader uh, uh, legal change in the form of an open norm or an interpretive instrument. For those of us in the UK, this is not news. We are already we are already introducing this type of exception following the Hargreaves review of the UK copyright frameworks. So the, the fair dealing exception for text and data mining is already taking place in the UK. What we believe needs to happen is that the rest of Europe needs to follow suit. 
So, in conclusion, what, am I, what are the points I've tried to make? We believe that the EU copyright frameworks need uh, reform to support uh, education and uh, research. And this needs to be done on an international basis. It isn't right for each member state to have to uh, work through each of these issues on their own and then come up with their own solutions. So in the areas of MOOCs uh, and, and SPOCs and overseas campuses, we think licensing is the solution with an agreed norms at an international level on how this is done. The text and data mining, we do not believe that licensing is the route to follow. We will not follow a licensing route. We will argue it, uh, instead for an exception for text and data mining in the European uh, community. So if you have been, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so thank you very much for giving us a pretty clear view of how these issues connect cross borders. Now, you gentlemen need to change seats. Yeah. And I'd like to introduce you to Professor Ronan Beasley from the Faculty of Law at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Ronan has some slides, which I believe we're just going to get, and I'll take advantage of this moment to do some housekeeping. There's been a memory stick found on the floor, and if anyone has lost it, it's Jamie's. Good. Um, that's great. So, Ronan, are you ready to go? What I think we'll do, because the remainder of the panellists have uh, promised me that they can keep their interventions relatively short, so we'll run through the line-up on the programme and then we'll get into a discussion. Ron, back to you. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, some of you in the room will know me only as an, uh, an academic and not as an archivist and might wonder why on earth I have the, 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 the cheek to co-op the archival voice. Um, but I qualified as an archivist in 2012, so I feel like I, I have some, uh, some sounds to do so. Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit about information across borders uh, with a view from the archive. Archive collections aren't, I think, always very well understood, but archives collect unique, authentic, trustworthy records produced by government, private, public organisations, families <coughs> and individuals during the day-to-day -day activities or business, and while they have enormous political, social, cultural, scholarly uh, significance, they're rarely created for the purpose of commercial exploitation. And indeed, there's no tradition of collective management of unpublished archival <coughs> materials, and um, I doubt that it's even really possible to have collective representation of the types of authors that produce the types of documents and records that are typically housed in archives. Archives, uh, archivists want to work within the law. Um, this statement's from the Universal Declaration of Archives and it neatly captures the bind that archivists find themselves in. Archives, uh, we want to work together in, in, to, in order that archives are made accessible to everyone, everyone, not just everyone within our jurisdiction, but everyone, uh, while respecting the pertinent laws and rights of individuals, creators, owners and users. And right there in that sentence captures an awful lot of what we've been discussing over the last four days. Archivists are law-abiding people. They want to operate within the law. Um, but they do want to make their collections as accessible as possible to everyone, and that often involves making copies for users and institutions outside of their own jurisdiction. Now, we've made a lot of interventions um, uh, and comments over the last few days, so I won't spend too long on this, but the type of requests for material that archivists are typically presented with from overseas, requests for government records, unpublished non-government records, business records, private papers, uh, un unpublished photographic records, and sometimes some published works, newspaper clippings, might be journal articles, uh, books that have um, manuscript amendations in the uh, uh, marginalia and so on, so the, the, what's being copied is the, the notes on the published book, and that's of interest to people, not, not, not the book itself. Okay. And why do people ask for these things? Well, private studies, scholarly research, legal research, genealogy, local history, exhibitions, and so on. Um, user expectations are also something that I think everybody needs to bear in mind. Um, my colleague, Bill Maher, um, said in December here, we have to recognize that in the 21st century, if something is not online, it may as well not exist. And I think that is true for a lot of users, These this new generation of people that uh, have been born into a born digital environment. Um, Leslie Richman, who's a university archivist at, at my university, made this statement at an event uh, we hosted with the Wellcome Trust in London recently. Users are demanding, they're unforgiving, and more and more, they're very unimpressed. If we can't produce material online. Um, 
I'll give you a, 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 a statistic, and Tim will correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here. For every single physical document or record that's requested in the National Archives at Kew in uh, London, over 200 digital documents are accessed through uh, the National Archives um, digital portal. And I'd also marry that with the fact that less than 2% of the entirety of the archival documents and records in the UK have been digitized yet. There is huge demand for digital version. That's what users want, so they can access without having to get on a plane, without having to get on a train. Um, and archivists want to facilitate that access. But we're not just talking about information across borders when we're thinking of archives. We're also talking about evidence across borders. Wendy Duff and others put it well when they said recently, in addition to the information contained in archival records, they also have value as evidence of actions. The evidential value uh, of archival records gives them great power as legal documents, as evidence in court, and as agents of accountability. Archives um, <coughs> are one of the principal institutions that we, that we rely upon in society to hold our government to account. So I want to very briefly talk about a recent case in the UK that concerned the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya in 1956-1959. In June last year, the British government um, <coughs> reached an historic settlement where they agreed to pay £19.9 .9 million in compensation to settle an action taken by five Kenyans who were involved in that uprising and who were held in British prison camps in Kenya at the time. They were subjected to um, torture and other forms of ill treatment and had engaged in a lengthy campaign um, to see the justice of their case heard out before the British court. As a part of that action, or, or because of that action, the British government admitted to the existence of a vast archive of documents and records, many of which corroborated the claimant's accounts of abuse. And Mr Justice McCoon, in the case, said, the documentation here is voluminous. The government and military commanders seem to have been meticulous record keepers. And because of those records, um, justice was able to be delivered in this case. But not only that, it transpired that the British government had sequestered records not just relating to Kenya, but to a number of um, previous colonies of, of the, the British Empire um, in a secure private research centre in Hanslow Park in Buckinghamshire, rather than handing these official records and documents over to the National Archives, as would or should have been um, the case. So archives are also about politics. It's always nice to have a bit of Derrida in any kind of academic presentation. Archive fever is one of his most impenetrable and uh, uh, difficult to understand texts. Um, but he's right when he says there is no political power without control of the archive. And archives are politics in, in all sorts of ways. I like this statement from the Council of Europe in 2000. A country does not become fully democratic until each of its inhabitants has the possibility of knowing in an objective manner the elements of their history. Now, what happens when those elements of their history, uh, those records are dispersed across the globe as a result of um, you know, displaced records in post-conflict societies or post-colonial nations that are held in England, in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and so on and so forth. How do we facilitate access to those records? What should happen to the record set that the British government hid away in that secure research centre? Should it be dispersed across those uh, various countries to which they relate? I'd like that, those records, also to be held um, in Britain so that I and others can interrogate them and ask questions of the British government's foreign and domestic policy at that time. Um, multiple users want to engage with record sets uh, to understand their own countries. Just one minute. Okay. So archives aren't just about information, um, they're political beasts, they're about evidence, accountability, they're about the politics of memory, identity, and they're about social justice. I'll, I'll finish by saying something about the genocide archive in Rwanda. I was privileged to visit Rwanda last June at the invitation of the Institute for the National Museums of Rwanda, and when I was there I visited the, the genocide memorial in Kigali, 
and I got uh, to meet the director of the Genocide Archive in Rwanda. Now they've done an amazing job in memorialising the impact and the legacy um, of the, the genocide in Rwanda, which of course happened 20 years ago. What they want to do is um, to help the rest of the world understand how that genocide occurred and work towards the prediction, prevention and elimination of genocide through research, education and the dissemination of information and advice. They have a wealth of material that was published that um, in the 20 years prior to the genocide. Um, propaganda that they want to digitise, they want to make available because they want the world to understand how it was that the genocide came about. What were the triggers? What were the reasons? What were the causes? All of that material is in copyright and it belongs to people who fled the country after the genocide. A lot of it's orphans because they can't locate the perpetrators and those perpetrators don't want to be located. The archive wants to digitise and make that material available but they want to do so lawfully. They want to make it available online. They want people to engage with and understand the circumstances of that country, but they want to act within the bounds of copyright. And that means dealing with orphan works. I'll, I, I know my time is limited, so I'll, I'll not say what I was going to say about um, the European uh, response to orphan works. I'll simply finish with a plug. Uh, I said uh, yesterday I've done some research on archives and copyright. I am an, an academic first and an archivist second, and if anyone's interested in finding out more about my research or reading more about the way in which copyright enables but also inhibits uh, the archival mission, this is a good place to start. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ronan. Just to note, of course, that you can interrogate Ronan yes, you can. on all of this uh, in just a moment. So I'd like to welcome Trish Hepworth, who's the Copyright Advisor at the Australian Library's Copyright Committee, uh, who's going to make a few uh, remarks about the situation down under, I guess. Over to you, Trish. So, what I wanted to do... Oh, uh, microphone's not on. Okay, with any luck that's better, yes? Yeah. Fantastic. So we're off to a rolling start. So what I wanted to do in this presentation today is not to be looking at any of the sort of much more technical detail because that's more than well covered by my other speakers today. But just to give you basically a snapshot or a case study of the current issues facing Australia. So Australia, as I mentioned the other day, is a developed, relatively wealthy country. We have a very good copyright system. We are going through a process of reform at the moment and we've just had um, some recommendations for reform of both preservation copying and document supply provisions in Australia to make it easier to make preservation copies and to streamline document supply. But we do already have some these exceptions and at the moment it looks like they will definitely be preserved as being understood to be essential as we move forward. So we're a small, relatively wealthy country with a very established, well-respected copyright regime. And one of the things that libraries have been telling us for an awful long time is that they have issues with copyright. An awful lot of issues with copyright. One of the big impetuses for the domestic reform was libraries. But it wasn't just domestic problems, it was cross-border. So what we did is to prepare basically for this SCCR, we actually thought, well, we'd better go and ask them and work out exactly what it is because we've heard the complaints, but maybe we've just got a lot of really grumpy librarians out there. <laughs> so we surveyed 16 libraries and two large purchasing consortia, the ones for the academic libraries and the one for National and State Libraries Australia. We surveyed a range of libraries from the national library to provincial level libraries to the public libraries and academic libraries. So we thought we had a reasonable cross section. And this is a result, this in visual form is the result of how much cross border we do just in the areas of document supply and interlibrary loan, just for 15 libraries. So Australia does 77. In those 15 libraries, there were 77 countries that Australia dealt with. 
And as you can see, they range from Tarawa and Kiribati, a tiny, tiny dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, through to an awful lot of business that we do with the powerhouses of, say, the United States or the United Kingdom with their very long academic traditions. And then we go through to places like Abuja or Santiago. So it's across the world. And these are both receiving and sending documents to document supply and interlibrary loan. For a lot of these documents, these are items that you cannot source anywhere else. The National Library of Australia or the Yarra Plenty Region Libraries, which are some of our domestic public libraries, are not necessarily the first point of call that people would think of if they wanted to source material. The reason that they end up there is because these items often cannot be sourced anywhere else. Australian libraries, of course, comply with their copyright law and all of these are supplied or requested under the document supply and interlibrary loan provisions. However, majority of libraries that we surveyed noted that they had had requests for material denied. And sometimes this is, well, often this is one-off material, material that they cannot source from any other place. And let me tell you, it took me 31 hours to get from Canberra to Geneva. <laughs> If you discover that the only doc copy of the document you need happens to be in Riga, or the only copy of the document you happen to need is in Brasilia, it's an awful long way and incredibly expensive to travel from Australia to get there. The other big issue that came through loud and clear from the libraries was that to do with contracts. So as I said, we've got reasonably okay library and archive provisions in Australia, but what we found was that almost all libraries that we surveyed had signed onto contracts that strove to restrict or eliminate some of those exceptions. And this was particularly the case for electronic resources. To give you an idea, for a public or state library, they're generally signing about 10 to 25 percent of their content each year is done under digital licensing. For the academic libraries, it's more like 80% to 90% of their content. So if you're signing that sort of quantities of licenses, the fact that your library and archive provisions are being overridden causes substantial damage. The big ones, of course, that they did were a lot of restrictions on document supply, especially document supply overseas. There were also restrictions within document supply on being able to deliver things digitally. So you get the ridiculous situation where you're allowed to provide an article under document supply as long as you take the electronic copy, print it off, photocopy it, put it in an envelope and send it by snail mail. Which is, you know, an administratively burdensome and environmentally wasteful way of delivering content. There are also problems with document supply that had long embargo periods. So the document supply might be allowed, but only after you've signed up for two or three years. We had restrictions from the academic libraries and material being put into course packs. And very importantly for Australia, um, restrictions on being able to provide remote access even for registered users or registered students. And in a country where if you drive from one side of the country to the other, it's going to take you two or three days, well, probably four if you don't want to kill anybody. Remote access is of critical importance. And the other big one that they removed was preservation copying. Now, the reason I want to show you this, this is the digital preservation room, one of the digital preservation rooms at the National Library of Australia. And it came up today um, in the plenary session where somebody mentioned from the Publishers Association that, you know, this potentially wasn't such a pressing issue, that there was no maybe urgency for this. The, the documents that libraries are currently trying to preserve are deteriorating right now. And one of the biggest problems we face are with things that are digital preservation. So these are, say, Word documents. Now, if you get something that was written in the first version of Word, you can't just take the floppy disk and throw it into your computer. 
For a start, I would be mildly amazed if anybody has a computer that currently has a floppy disk drive in it. But we get this material all the time. In those big square floppy disks, 